The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. team, Ben Nash here. I'm one of the co-founders at XY Advisor and founder of the rapidly growing Pivot Wealth, which is my business baby. I started from scratch about eight years ago, and I've since scaled up to become one of Australia's better known financial advice companies for high income accumulators. You can join me every Tuesday as I have the pleasure of furthering my own knowledge by interviewing some of the best people in our industry and beyond to improve every part of what we do with our advice process. We're currently hiring financial advisors and associates, so if our approach resonates, you can learn more at pivotwealth.com.au forward slash careers. This episode is brought to you by Australian Retirement Trust, a fund that's more super for you and your clients. With more than 2 million members and over $200 billion under management, they have more access to super smart investments at home and abroad. They're committed to working with over 4,000 advisors and delivering a world of investment opportunities to help your clients live the retirement they want. Visit australianretirementtrust.com.au forward slash advisor. Include Super Savings and Q Super FUM and members at June 2022. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor team and today uh, I'm really pumped to be here with a good mate of mine and business coach Steve Salvia. Steve uh, is a coach with and founder of uh, Blackwing Profit Consulting. He was a financial planner for two and a bit decades before that, owned accounting businesses, mortgage broking. He's uh, He's been in the game for for a long time, but uh, he's turned to the uh, the dark side slash the bright side or something, <laughs> depending on how you look at it, I suppose, um, a bunch of years ago and now helps financial planners do better business. So, Steve, mate, thanks for joining us. Hey, mate. Great to be on with you, Ben. Been a long time, so uh, pumped to be having a chat with you. And you know there is a dark side and a light to every single coin. You know that, don't you? <laughs> That's it. Depends that you, you. I think you ask any financial planner. It depends on which day of the week you ask them as to what they might. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Mate, obviously you see inside a lot of advice businesses through the work that you do. So I thought maybe a good place to start is what are some of the trends that you're seeing in the market at the moment? Uh, look, mate. There's there's so many things going on. You know, everyone everyone knows what's been going on. Being the last, as, and as you know as well, last eighteen months, two years, even you know, go back to three years. Probably now, if you think about it, you know, there's so much going on with all the, the regulators and the decision makers and all the powers that be have put all this, um, all, all these um, rules and regulations and just made it really, really difficult. As we, you know, as we all know, uh, made it pretty difficult to be a financial planner. So there's, a, a, there's quite a few uh, trends that are happening on the, on the good side of things. But there's also what I'm finding a lot of, Ben, is that uh, people are spending a lot of time innovative, you know, innovating. You know, everyone's trying to find better and smarter and faster ways to do things. You know, we're sort of getting caught up a lot of the time well, from, from you know, my discussions with planners anyway, getting caught up in the kind of the back end and the tech and putting it all the, all the tech together and things like that. So I'm finding that a, a, lot, of, a lot of time and effort is being spent on the kind of the back end, the, the tech stacks and the, the, the putting all that side of things together, which is really important. You know, of course, you, you have to do that and you've got to have your tech stack right. But what I'm finding is it's taking a lot of time and effort away from the kind of the front end of the business. You know, it's like it's like mm-hmm. being an opera singer on the there's a front stage and the uh, there's a front stage and a backstage of the in the of the business and the financial planner should be really spending most of their time on the front stage. You know, in mm-hmm. front of the crowd, doing the gig. You know, getting the applause and you know getting roses thrown on the stage and all that sort of thing. You know, but yeah. and, and you know, that's that's what their value is. You know, as uh, as far as that goes, but we're we're caught doing the the back end, the props and the makeup and the the the, the cleaning up afterwards <laughs> and things like that. And we and we get caught doing that. You know, if you think about the eighty, the Pareto principle, I reckon it's a eighty twenty flipped in inversely. I reckon if you spoke yeah. to most financial planners generally, it's going to be fairly close to I'm doing, uh, you know, twenty to thirty percent client facing, income producing, business growth activity, the front stage stuff, and they're doing sixty, seventy, eighty percent of the back stage stuff as well. Even mm-hmm. if they've got a team, they see, they seem to end up getting their, uh, you know, everything seems to land on their 
on their lap. They, they, the financial planner seems to be the bottleneck. Ben, I don't know. Tell me, tell me if I'm right or wrong. Um, you know, you're you're doing it day yeah. to day. It's 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 a it's a big thing. I'm finding is that we're we're spending so much time in the back end and and not as focused on the front end where the where the where the humans are, where the people are. So yeah, yeah, so, totally. yeah a fair bit going on. That's for sure. I know for us that um, one of the things that's really helped over the last little bit is building a, a leadership team inside the business and and starting yeah. to offload some of those things. And yeah. I think as financial planners, particularly for the business owner, financial planners, it's like you're looking to grow a team, and it's like you need a you need a role field. So you start hiring for a role, but what happens? And this come a, a saying from a mate of mine that you end up being like the guru with a thousand followers that you've got, 100%. you might have a great para planner, or you might have a great CSO, or you might have a great marketing support person, but yeah. at the end of the day, you're still the guru. So everything that happens, as you say, that it all comes onto your desk. So now what we're doing is we're trying to go, well, actually let's, you own that. And then you can be mm. the guru and then yes. people can come to you and you slowly sort of trying to remove yourself from those things. Cause all the things are good things. They're important things, but it's like, yeah. You, but like do they have to be done by you? Do they have to be done? Right. Even though they're important, even though they're all good and important, do they actually have to be done by you? And I think, I think it's also important um, to actually for, for you or me or the advisor to actually position these other people is just important, just as important as what the actual advisor is. So it's a lot about how the advisor and the advisor's normally got the relationship with the client. It's really a lot about how they actually position that person to the client as well. So we mm. want to train. It's 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 all a lot of it comes down to actually training up the client. So if the client is trained up right up front to come to you as the go to person, well then naturally the the, the uh, client or the prospect is going to come straight to you as the go to person. But if they're educated mm. right up front, if you come to me for these specific things, technical strategy, got a question to ask about, around advice or or, uh, or got a problem or, or, or an issue you're trying to uh, fix from a, from an investment point of view or whatever it happens to be, come to me. Come to Anne on front desk for this and that and the other thing or to change tax file numbers or small admin things. If it's something to do with the plan that we're working on, go to Anne Marie, you know, th this, this sort mm. of thing. So actually positioning what people's roles are and actually in, in introducing them really early in the piece and getting the client to actually buy into that as well. You forgot to mention yeah. um, the go-to for recommendations around Beard Balm, which is a role that I'm happy to and and like to continue to fulfil in the business. Um, moving well, I forward, think that so. I, again, if you were if you were doing more than twenty percent um, marketing around the Beard Balm, <laughs> that that could be a definite side hustle for you, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, what are you what are you seeing as the biggest roadblocks for good financial planning businesses at the moment? You mentioned a few things there already, but what are the what are the top ones that you yeah. see? Oh, look, um, it is. It's funny we started off with that because um, I, I really I reckon one of the biggest roadblocks that we've got is that the clients clients are in control. Um, where financial planners aren't managing their diaries, they aren't managing their time. They're not setting boundaries. With uh, with clients, and therefore, what's happening is, from what I've what I'm seeing in or what I'm hearing in my discussions with with financial planners, you know, financial planners are getting pulled from pillar to pillar to post. So, one thing that's really important, one of the things I teach my my coaching club guys, my Blackwing guys, is that you know you need to be the one in control. And we kind of have a little phrase, and Ben, you know, from our work together years ago, you know, you, you, I always just I always say, um, this is how it's done around here. So the way we do it here at XYZ Financial Planning is here we do it this way and this way and this way and mr klein if you like that that's great that's good that, that, that's going to work really really well and if you don't like it the way we do it here well then that's fine as well but we're probably not going to have a long-term relationship so if the way that you do it is positioned right up front you that gives you control right and and that needs to be done right up front um it's kind of like um he or she who makes the rules wins the game so yeah. it's either it's either the planners in control or the business is in control or the client can, the clients in control. Now a lot mm. of the a lot of the politically correct, correct posse out there right now might say, oh well, it's all about the client. It has to be about the client. We have to uh, we have to sort of um, think about everything that's got to be to do with the client, and that's fine mm. and it kind of makes sense. But it, at the end of the day, if you run with that, you're then uh, the client becomes the leader and you become the follower. 
and we have to, yeah. you know, we go off on tangents and go down rabbit holes and get pulled from pillar to post, as I mentioned. So, so being in control really, really early uh, in the piece, and it's not you don't, it's not done in a rude or a, or a nasty way or anything like that. It's just kind of setting down the ground rules straight away, so that you are the leader and the clients are the ones that are following you, because we've got a commercial right. business to run, Ben. You've got a commercial yeah. business to run. So here's how we do it. If you like it, that's great. And if you don't like it, that's cool too. But this is how we this is how it's done around here. That sort of thing. So uh, so that's a big one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, I think absolutely like people people come to us because we're the experts. So it's like I was having this conversation with one of the guys in our team yesterday, and it's like, oh, they come to us because they've got these frustrations and they want this help. And then you start talking to them about how we do it. And then all of a sudden they become the experts and they're going, oh, yes. we do this and it's working. It's like, well, hold on a second. But why did why did you mention that all these things aren't working? So do that. So I think you're absolutely ben, right that you've got to lead because if you don't, like if you end up um, working with every client in exactly the way that they think that they want to be worked with, then you're going to have to charge $30,000 for a financial plan because you're going to run the most inefficient business on the planet. Well, there's two things with that, Ben. The first one with the with Mr. Client, what, you, what you'd be saying is to, I, I always think about um, to know and not to do is not to know. So just because they know mm-hmm. it and if, if they haven't done it, well, they don't really know it at all because if they did know it, they should have done yeah. it by now and why are they even talking to you in the first place, right? So to know and not to do is not to know. And the second part of it is we uh, what we talk about in Coaching Club there's this thing that they talk about you need to have a bespoke business, right? You want to be bespoke. You've got to be um, specific to the client and everything's about that specific client and every single client's different and, and, and everything's got to be bespoke. And that's true and it's all well and good, but the reality is you've also got to run a commercial business as well. So the phrase mm. that we use at Coaching Club is we talk about bespoke cookie cutter, right? Bespoke <laughs> cookie cutter. We want a bespoke cookie cutter business. So the advice and the strategy and the tactics and the names and addresses and all the all the details are, are, are critically and absolutely bespoke to the client. But we've also yes. following a process that we use within our business, which makes it much easier to, to run the business. It streamlines everything you, that way. And, and what you can do then, you can then lead the client on a conversation which covers off all the things that you need to do and uncover all this, all the bespoke and very specific things that the client uh, needs to share with you and the, the, yeah, the, get the questions that you need answered. But it also allows you to um, run your back office much more efficiently, do the um, do the do do your file notes in a much more efficient way, do your handover to your power planner in a much more efficient way because the the, the process and the strategy and the systems are, are – I'm, I'm, I'm using the word cookie cutter, but you know what I mean? They're, they're very similar. But they've got – yeah, but they've got um, bespoke details for each and every client. It makes the handover mm. of the power plan, uh, power planning and the strategy notes easier. It makes the productions of the power planning and the strategy notes easier. It makes the app, uh, production of the admin and any paperwork that you've got to do easier because you're working on bespoke cookie cutter. So if you're going yep. – again, if you're going off on 10, 20, 15 different tangents or it's a different method or a different way each and every time – that you're talking to a client, it's going to be, it's, it's too, it's too hard to streamline. It's too hard to, it's also too hard to, hard to systemize and to automate as well. So I think, yeah, so I really like the phrase train a team. Sorry, I was just going to say, it's impossible to train a team around that, that if you, if your process is consistent for every client, it means that the, whether it's the associate, the CSO, the power planner, the, the admin support, like they know what's coming and then they can plan yeah. their work appropriately if everyone's different. This is how I, it's I know done, that some yeah. people do it, but it's like how on yeah. earth do you run a team around that? This is how it's done around here. So this is the XYZ financial planning way. And if the prospect or the client likes that, that's great. But if they don't like it, that's great too. But this is how it's done mm. around here. It's really important. So that's number one. The other probably thing... Um, Roblox is, I, I reckon, and we kind of touched on it a little bit. I reckon poor delegation. I reckon that's a. I, I just, I'm just finding more and more that financial planners are a little bit maybe I don't know that if it's the word timid, or it's a little bit different environment from five or ten or fifteen or twenty years ago. You know, where we're really conscious about the feelings of the people that we're that are working with us that, that are in our team. So the so our delegation skills have dropped off dramatically. So it's like I, I know I've got to delegate that, but I'll, I'll get it done. I don't. I know they're overloaded, or they've got too much to do, or they're working on this other thing. I'll just do it myself, right? And and the reality yeah. is, and we get back to that bottleneck where you, it, 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 everything ends up on your desk, or it doesn't actually end up on your desk. It ends up in piles on the floor in the as you walk in your office. 
right? Mm. And, uh, and, 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 and that piles up and then the next client comes in and the next client comes in and you end up with all these piles of, of work to do because we haven't got the delegation skills down pat. So one of the things I'd suggest to everyone, guys, you really need to have a think about your delegation and, and become a, you've got to become a master of delegation these days. You know, it, um, you want to be... Um, you want to be focused on the the high. We talk about, um, you know, what should a what should a high end professional financial planner be doing day to day? If you think about it, what are the core um, activity? It should be income. So it should be income producing, client facing, business growth, relationship building, strategic and technical. You got to do some compliance as well because that's part of it as well. You know, high end financial planner activities, right? And then there's the rest. Right now, the, there's all the rest, all the stuff, and all of that stuff is really, really important. But should it be done by the financial advisor? It should. It's either. No. It's Ben. It's like you know. If I say, and I know we don't charge like this, but if I ask, if I ask the financial planner, if I, I'll ask you, Ben. Like, mate, if I had to ask you, and I know you don't charge like this, but Ben, if I asked you, what should, what would if you were charging out by the hour, what would you charge? What would you say roughly? Best a thousand bucks. Good. Thousand good. bucks. Do a thousand and ten. That's better because it takes it around. But yeah, but you know, if you were charging by the hour, you know, most financial planners would say around the 300, 350 mark, right? Roughly. Yeah. Right? Something like that. So it's either a 300 dollars an hour job or it's a forty or thirty, thirty dollar an hour job. So yeah. financial planners are spending twenty percent of their time roughly doing the three hundred dollar an hour jobs and only and eighty percent of their time doing the thirty, thirty dollar, forty dollar, fifty dollar an hour jobs. It doesn't make mm. sense. So we've got to flip the we've got to flip the switch somehow. You can't avoid, you can't do a hundred percent of those jobs because some of the things just have to be done. But if we can get to a 60, 40 or a 70, 30, where you're doing the 300 and mm. 350 dollar jobs, our jobs rather than the 35 dollar an hour jobs, it'll, it'll be a game changer for everyone. So there's a, so the delegation part of it is really, really important. Yeah, I think the other part of that is as well, particularly for business owners, but for financial advisors and really for anybody, I think, in any mm. role in a business that um uh another coach once taught me that it's like red you have red tasks and green tasks it's like green tasks are the things that are that you enjoy that you feel like you're really good at where you feel like you're really happy when you're doing them and then you've got red tasks that sap your energy yeah. and if you do yes. a diagnostic and look back at your week and go what tasks were red and what tasks were green yeah. the more red you've got they're the things that you should be delegating so that you feel happy in the work that you're doing as much as the value and i think that's critical as well but um, you don't want to be doing things that you're not happy doing because otherwise you're just going to be grumpy at the end of the week. Uh, instead well, of feeling so like we, we what we do, one of the first exercise, when I work with a new client, and I'm not sure, I think we might have even done this, Ben, um, we, we do this uh, uh, exercise called the love-hate relationship. So you've got to build yeah. a love-hate relationship <laughs> with your business, right? Because so what you want to do, you want to identify well, what are the things that you love in your business? And then what are the things that you hate in your business? So when you're thinking about delegation, yeah. well, the first thing to do, you're, you're going to delegate the things that you hate doing. We're going to find the people mm. to to do it uh, to delegate it to or to outsource it or whatever. So so the first thing to do is figure out what is it that you like, but not not only what is it that you like. It's what makes money, what grows the business, what builds relationships, what's client facing, all of those things. Yeah, they should be in the love side, and then all the rest is the uh, the the hate side of it. And bam, they're the thing, things that first go out first. Now the, the reality is you can't just get rid of every single thing that you hate and get rid of that tomorrow or, or next Thursday, but you might have a list of twelve things there in the in the hate list and you say right okay this month i'm going to find i'm going to get rid of three of those things and get those off my list mm. and delegate those to someone but what happens is when you get the right people and you build your team if you build the right team around you what you hate is probably what someone loves so that becomes yeah, totally. so it becomes a higher level thing in their love list that you don't want to do, but and they know that they should be doing it. They really enjoy doing. So you actually mm. position it like, "Hey, I don't like this thing, but you're the expert at this, man. You're great at this. Gee, you're you're fantastic at this this work. This is what you should be focused on. This so that I can get out and go out and grow the business and do all the things that I need to at the top end. So if it's yeah. if you build the right team, you can you can position it pretty pretty well. One of the big things, Ben, that I um, this is years ago, years ago, we worked out that I was getting like 60, 70, 80 emails daily you know and you know i opted in for things mm. and you know i was getting all these emails and all the emails and client emails and everything and my, my email address was on every business card and letterhead and all of the all of the stuff so so and everything was coming to me and of course i couldn't get through it all and then it'd go to the next day and then all of a sudden at the end of the week i'd have to sit there and wade through all these emails so what we decided to do we 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 decided we gave me what we call it what we call a secret squirrel email that only mm. i have and i give to my friends and my, my family and my wife and my kids, 
And then we had another business email address, which was Steve at Southern Financial, we were called. So it's Steve at Southern Financial. And that Steve at Southern Financial came into Daniela at the front desk. Uh-huh. And, da- and we, did, we, we came up with this thing that we called the four Ds. So Danny, so I was, so I ended up getting three or four or five emails from my family and my, and my mum, right? And <laughs> Daniela got the other 75 emails and she, so she did four things. We called it the four Ds. So, so what happened was, number one, uh, it was uh, Daniela did it herself, number one. So she did it herself. Da- uh, so it's do it, delegate it, decide when or ditch it. So she either did the thing herself. She um, delegated it in to, to me or to someone else if it needed to be delegated to someone in the office. Number three was decide when. So if it was something that I needed to see, she would put it in the calendar that you need to email Fred back at uh, 11.10 today. And so she'd, put it, she'd actually diarise it for me. Or the fourth one was ditch it. So she'd either do it herself. And we got to a point where Daniela even had an email address. So some, I'd get an email to say, hey, Steve, here's that, um, here's that um, tax file number you were asking for. Daniela would go back on the email and say, hey, Bob, uh, hey, 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 Bob, thanks so much for that. I'll pass it on to Anne-Marie. Appreciate you getting it back to me so quick, Steve. And she'd sign my name at the bottom of it and send that thing out. Because Steve Selby didn't need to know that a, that a tax file number or a payslip had come in. Hmm. She got hmm. it. It went straight to, um, to Angela out in the power planning department. And, and Steve was none the wiser. In the meantime, I was out there building the business, making income, seeing clients, doing all the growth-oriented things, and, and, and that, that email I didn't even need to see. So that was a really cool one. The 4Ds is a really good one as well. Why I didn't need to see all those emails, and I just got them out of my life, basically. Yeah, that's Makes a sense? good one. Um, yep. Yeah, I've, uh, that's why it took me so long to actually pin down you for a calendar invite for today because you still don't have an email that, uh, that uh, you hard, can access. Mate, you, 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 I don't have – look, it's hard. You, no one knows my secret squirrel address, and it's pretty hard to pin me down. <laughs> so that's, 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 part of the, that's part of the scarcity thing as well. If you, if you want to have an appointment with me – find me you'll, you'll know how if you want me you'll find me that sort of thing so yeah mm. Steve what's yep. um what do you see obviously growth is a focus for people at the moment but what do you think are the fastest ways for people to grow uh it's uh look that's a it's an interesting question um the reason I say it's an interesting question is because it the fastest way to grow is it depends on what level you're at right so we talk about we talk about uh, six levels of a financial advice business or of career even. Like you're either at the, at the sort of the foundations part, you're at startup or you're at struggle or strive. I say struggle, but, you know, maybe politically correct, you should say strive. So it's startup, struggle, strive, stability, success, scale or significance, right? So every financial planner, whether you're self-employed or not self-employed, you're at one of those levels. You're at the startup stage, you're at the struggle stage, you're at the stability stage, you're at the success stage, uh, scale stage or the significant stage. So depending on where you're at, 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 at with what level you're at currently, you need to focus on the thing that's right for you to be doing at your level of growth. Because one of the problems I find is that um, I've got people down at, you know, there's people I see, people who are, who are at startup or struggle stage, but they're looking up at the advisors who are up at scale, you know, success or scale or significance and saying, oh, I need to do that, or I should be doing that thing that that person up there did, or that person at that level is doing this thing up here. But really what they needed to focus on was the things that they need to get that that are going to get them from startup up to uh, to strive or struggle. And then if you're at strive or struggle, then then you've you've got to do those things that are going to get you to grow to stability and then to success and scale and significance. So so, um, the fastest ways to grow are figuring out, firstly, where you sit. We call it the profit pyramid. So where are you at on that profit period? The first thing is to identify where you're at. And then secondly, once you know where you're at, what are the things that I need to have ticked off to say, right, I've done that, 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 and that. And these things are all implemented into my business, which will then take you to the next level. Now, at the next level, what are the things that you need to do to implement at that point uh, to, that are going to get me to the next level and to the next level, the next level? Now, someone like yourself, you know, when we first met, you were probably at startup or, you know, at that sort of strife stage. That's when we first met. And the work that we did I'm together, we struggling. did things. We're all struggling, but you get what I mean. But you move you move up the ladder. The things that you and I did together, we were, they were the things that you needed to do. They were the right things for you to be doing down there. And that got you to stability. Mm. And that got you to success. And you're at a point now where you're at scale and significance. 
Now, now, I think most financial planners who know you or anyone in our, our sort of sphere or our, or our network know that you're doing things way up here that most financial planners aren't doing because, but, but you ticked off the startup and the struggle and the stability. You got to success. And remember, I think really early in the piece, Ben, my job with a financial planner, if you're not at success yet, my job is to get you to success as quick as I can. But one, and pe- once you get to success, it's to get your ass out of there as quick as we possibly can, can as well, because success is a trap. What happens? You think mm. about it, someone gets to some from startup to struggle to stability to, to success. What happens when they get to success? Yeah, you get complacent. It's the good enough Made stage. It. I'm here. I don't need to really push or hustle or, or do anything like that. So it's actually a trap. So people get to, it takes a long time to get to success. But once people get there, they actually get stuck there for the longest time as well, because they don't have the drive that, that, that they need to get them there. So we've got to get to success as quick as we possibly can, but then we've got to get your backside out and get you move up to scale and significance kind of in the in the area that you're at. Mm. So so that's I think that's that's really important as well. Yeah, I think I've know that I've definitely been there earlier on in the piece that you get distracted with things and think that you need to do, you know, you need to be everywhere on on social media. And I know that we are in a lot of places now, but like trying to do it back in the day and you just end up spread too thin or that I've got to have okay. some advertising funnel and you know all of these things that you look at great businesses and you go shit yeah i should have that but really yeah. the right move at the wrong time it's still the the wrong move so you got to you got to get all those those chocks in place you, you've you've got to, you've got to get yourself out there and you've also got to have you've got to have a, a reason for people to listen to you so you you do want to build some authority and you've also oftentimes you do want to have something that you can offer people so that they so that they can reach out and, and talk to you you've got to have a compelling offer for people but you know it doesn't it, it, it depend depending on where you're at will be uh, will be commensurate to the type of thing that you've got to get out there so there's different types of marketing there's different types of positioning there's different sort of messaging depending on where you're at uh, in your in your in your um, profit pyramid right so yeah so it's really important to, so again the first thing is to identify that and then figure out what needs to be done at that point if, if you think about it if you're at startup there's no point thinking about um, uh, like uh, like the, one of the problems I find, Ben, is people that start up and struggle and even stability, they spend most of their time in the back end, in the back office, mm-hmm. focusing on their delivery and their tech stack and their templates and automation and all, all of those things, right? And they spend their time doing all that stuff, but they've got no one coming in the front end. Yeah. So, right? So what's the point? You've got this You've got this all singing, all dancing back end and delivery process, but you've got no clients or prospects in the front, front end. In my opinion, yeah. it should be around the other way. Bring the clients in, put a little bit of pressure on the model and create a little bit of a, a bottleneck. And it's, a, it's amazing what you can do from the back end or from, a, from an implementation point of view once you've got a little bit of, once you're under a little bit of pressure, right? Yeah. So absolutely. if you're at startup and struggle, forget the back end. Yes, you can't literally forget it, but you shouldn't be spending 50, 60% of your time on the back end. Get some prospects in the door, get some money, some bumps, some appointments in the calendar, some bums on seats and some money in the bank. And that'll mm. give you that give you that little bit of breathing space. And then you can sort of take a step back and say, right, we've got this, we've got this little bit of a bottleneck now. We've got this little bit of a pressure. We have to spend a little bit of time and a little bit of effort over here on the back end. But mm. we've got, but, but you know, I can push out clients for two or three weeks. I can build a little bit of a system behind the, the scenes. Don't spend all your time with this all singing, all dancing back end program with a process with no 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 financial, with no clients coming in the coming in the door. If that makes sense. That's right. And money can solve a lot of problems as well. It's like if you could have a sh- a, a slick back end, but if you don't have any dollars, then you can't grow, um, and you're not yeah. making any money, which sucks. But well, that's a that's, that's a short that's a short term strategy, mate. If no, well, my business is called Blackwing Profit Consulting. Right, Blackwing Profit Consulting. So for me, the biggest problem in my prospect or my my base, right, the people that I work with, it's so important I put it in our business name. It's profit. Mm. So we've got all the turnover and we've got all the staff and we're growing our businesses and we're winning all these awards and we're doing all this and that and the other thing, but at the end of the day, show me the money. Yeah. And so so Blackwing Profit Consulting, I think to myself, right, what is the overall? There's lots of things, lots of stuff that financial planners need to do, but what's the biggest problem? It's profit. So that's why we're called yeah. Blackwing Profit Consulting because I find it's the biggest problem. So we're doing all this work and we've got these great businesses, but there's no cash. So we need money. Mm. We're running a commercial business. It's not a charity or benevolent society. Um, so you've got to charge professionally. You've got to um, you've got to um, get paid what you're worth. You've got to have a really good, strong pricing program. Uh, and you've got to charge for the work you do. And if the clients like it, that's great. But if they don't like it, that's great too because this is how it's done. Really. Yeah. We charge for our work. 
Yep. And I think if you're a business owner, you're probably, you know, working hard, you're motivated to work hard. But if you're working hard and you're not getting paid that or not getting paid well, then that sucks. Didn't, if you but if you're straight. working hard if you're working hard and you've got you're making heaps of money, at least that yep. gives you, you know, you you feel better about that. And then plus because you've got <laughs> heaps of money, then you can hire more people so that you work less, so that you can feel better and still make it, money as well. Yeah, it's a, and and, the, and again, of course, it's not all about money. There's so much more to it. But at the end of the day, if you can't, if you don't make a profit, you're gone. It's all over. You've just wasted your time. So it's it's lots and lots of things. Money is one of the critical uh, elements. Our, our mantra, Ben: money, meaning, and impact. Right? You've got to be profitable because if you can't not yeah. uh, profit, then then you want then you want to have meaning in what you do. And then what, if you've got money and meaning, you can then have, have an impact. So it may yeah, not necessarily be in that order. Hierarchy, yeah. right? Uh, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Just the other thing you're talking about the fastest way to grow, Ben. I, you know, I always come back to that that five ones formula. So, if for, for the guys who are listening, probably mostly financial planners and people in the um, financial advice space, you know, the five ones formula to me is the biggest or the fastest way for you to to grow your business. Um, and you know, for anyone who's listening, it's the the, the five ones formula. It's one person with one problem from one traffic source with one offer for one year, the rule of five ones. So we want to find that one person. Who is your ideal market? So everyone talks about niching and I'm going to niche, but you've really got, I believe, if you look at, you know, I've studied for many years now the sort of the top echelon of financial planners. I've looked at them closely. I know a lot of them. I've worked with heaps of them. You know, that sort of top 10, 15% of financial planners. And what I've found, Ben, over the years, that there's sort of 12 sort of traits that all those sort of top end people have, the, the, the best of the best financial planners, you know, anyone who's listened to this, you know, those who you look up to up there and you say, wow, that's he's he's doing it or she's doing it, she's a great planner, you know, they're, they're, they're really good at, at the top end of it. There's a certain number of traits that they kind of all have in com common. One of them is that most of them, not every single one, but most of them have a niche. So I, I, it's really important, in my opinion, for you to bed down and get really, really specific and work with one a niche. So it's that's the one person. One problem. Once you know the niche, you can then say, right, now I know the niche. What are the things that are going on in their world? What are their frustrations and fears we talked about before? What are their wants and aspirations? So once you know your niche, you can really get um, you, you can really get granular on what their problems are. And we can put messages out to the market that are specific to that person and their problem. So one person with one profit problem from one traffic source. So once you know the person and once you know the problems, the next step is where you're going to find them. So where do those people congregate on mass? But once you know the mm -hmm. niche, you can figure out where they congregate on mass. Then with one offer. So I don't mean one super fund or one insurance policy. I say it's it's what can I go out to market with and offer them, sort of hand them on a silver platter that they may think is valuable and they're going to either engage with me or interact with me or click the button if I need them to or whatever it is. What's the thing that I can offer them to get them to come towards me? Uh, and then the last one's one year. Now, you want to stick with your niche for for, uh, for a period of time, but, you know, you don't really need to, to spend a year to figure out whether your niche is working or w whether the niche is right or not. You know, you can probably, you can figure out, Within about 90 days, if you do it properly, you can spend about 90 days, but it'd be, be weird to say the four ones plus 90 minutes, so that's why we say the five ones. <laughs> so that, that doesn't sound right. So so it's, well, I say one year, but it's, it, within 90 days, if you do it right, you can figure out whether the niche that you've chosen is the right one and uh, should you persist with it or do you change your niche. But really that, I think that you five can ones figure out. You, you generally get a sense of like if it's not working, but I do agree with you and you are, you taught me this way back when, when I first started my business and um, I found it, yeah, like really important. That one year piece is actually quite important to build good momentum in the channels yep. that you're in. And I, I've been big on LinkedIn for a long time and I get, you know, I talk to other financial planners and they're like, oh, wow, Ben, like, that's cool. You do this and that. And they're like, we well, want to do it. And they do it for a bit and then they get distracted Give and they're up. not consistent. And I know that I've had times where I'm inconsistent and I see the impact of doing that. But the key is really just pick it and just hammer it out. And one of the things that we've done, I've done LinkedIn and then you it can expand to another channel after you've done that. If you try to start yep. doing LinkedIn or Instagram and Facebook and plus webinars, plus podcasts, like you just can't do it. You want to just add things on gradually and then just keep sticking to that and be consistent. And then you build the momentum in the, the that words, as well. 
the words are constant and consistent with your marketing, with your authority positioning. So you've positioned yourself as an authority in your space. That's what you've done. If you think about it, that's the reality of what you've done. And, you know, we talked about it five, five, four years ago, five years ago. You've now positioned mm. yourself over a period of time. But the reason you've done that is because you've been constant and you've been consistent in your space. And now mm. you're at the position where you're at that sort of scale and significance level simply because you did the things that you needed to do along the way. Right. So, yeah. so guys, don't give up, you know, um, double down on the niche. Um, what's the niche? Um, do, do you like that person? How to how to fit, how to pick a, a good niche, a decent niche? If, if they can, if you can tick these three boxes, you're going to be pretty close. Do you like them? Do you, you know, look, do you want to see them succeed? Can, uh, can they afford you? Do they have the money to pay for a financial advisor? And can you get them the result you want? Oh, sorry, can you get them the result that they want? Right. So, do you like that person? Can they uh, can they afford to pay you? And can you get them the results that one? If you can, if you can answer those three, you need to answer all three, pretty much. If if you can answer affirmative in those three, then you've pretty much you've got a pretty good niche that you that you got there. Absolutely, yeah. We went through that exercise, and it is important. There's a lot of things that you can do, but I think pick one, do it, be consistent. You can add more in, and you know, and it all sort yeah. of builds from there. Yeah, yeah. Steve, mate, thank you so much for sharing your insights. For anyone that's keen to learn more about what you do, what's the, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, best way, probably the place that I'm most prolific would be LinkedIn. So, dude, if you if you need want to have a chat, um, if you've got uh, anything you that you've heard, uh, if you've got anything that you like that you've heard from this podcast, reach out to me on LinkedIn, chat, private chat me in LinkedIn, on and just start a conversation with me. That's the the best way to find. We've got a website www blackwing.com.au but you know I'm, I'm, I'm mainly inside LinkedIn or you can uh, find me on Facebook do find me I'm, I'm around the place no no dramas at all if you if you want me you'll find me <laughs> no doubt no doubt yeah. well Steve thank you so much really appreciate it buddy um, yeah good, lots of great stuff there so uh, yeah look forward to hearing about those results and we'll catch you on the next one no worries mate cheers good to catch up <laughs>